chapter 10 uh, is part of the great prophecy of Daniel. It does not, however, have very much prophecy in it. Um, it has something more important than prophecy, as I will hope to explain to you this morning. I, I would like to call this chapter a man and his God and God's um, ministers. A man, his God, and God's ministers. What we are introduced to uh, in, in some surprising detail in the, in the 10th chapter of Daniel is a glimpse into the invisible workings of the universe. A glimpse into the invisible workings of the universe. Daniel was um, meditating, uh, praying, confessing, very similar to the situation that we looked at last Lord's Day in Daniel chapter 9. He was in the scriptures and then God responded to him as, he, as Daniel drew near to God, then God drew near to him. Daniel sent his angel, opened up an understanding of great momentous events to come in God's plan for the nation Israel. That essentially is the same thing that's happening in chapter 10 and chapter 11 in chapter 12, in, in the final three chapters of the book of Daniel, they are a union, a unity, because chapter 10 carries on into chapter 11, which completes the prophecy and the vision in chapter 12. These three chapters go together. But we're only going to look at them one chapter at a time, and we're going to focus on Daniel and his relationship to his God this morning, which is really what chapter 10 really shows to us and also God's ministers that God uses to accomplish his purposes on earth. How many of you have read the books by um, Frank Peretti? Um, Piercing the Darkness, and I forget what the other one is. You read that? Uh, fascinating fictional stories. Um, if you like, you know, um, stuff on angels, and if you like fiction, if you like to read, you'll enjoy those books. And I believe that they are not uh, a very far-fetched, um, if you want to say, uh, explanation of really what is going on around us in the invisible world. It's just that it's, whoops, it's a little bit, excuse me. It's okay. Um, I'm willing to die, Lord. No. I don't like being stung, whatever that was. Um, anyway. I lost my train of thought there momentarily. <laughs> Where was I talking? Oh, we were talking about the, the angelic world. <laughs> and there was one of those heavenly messengers, visible ones. Um, yes, uh, there are angels. Um, there are evil angels. There are good angels. Uh, there is stuff going on that we don't see. It's very real. According to the Bible, God who is a spirit, an invisible God, is very real. The devil, his arch enemy, is very real, and there is a higher, there is a great hierarchy of evil angels. There is a great hierarchy of good angels. Uh, there is warfare going on at this very moment. Maybe you feel like you're being beaten up. Maybe the the, the thoughts invading your mind, the distressing um, confusion and uh, whirlwind of activities going on in your personal life, and you wonder, well. How come this is like this? Um, I, I have, um, you know, we have the opportunity this morning to look into one chapter in the Bible that just kind of like pulls the cover off and lets us have a little glimpse into the spiritual world. It's a fascinating picture. This is a great chapter in the Bible if you're interested in this kind of thing. And if you're not interested or maybe have never been interested, I hope that you will become interested in it. You know. I believe that the natural world is really a mirror image of the spiritual world. You are born physically into this world. You had nothing to do with your physical birth. Uh, you have a father and a mother that, whose willpower resulted in you becoming physically born. And, and then when you're physically born, then you have to grow. You have, you know, you're normally you mature and you're here for a reason, a purpose, you have a function. And that is really a picture of what happens in the spiritual world. God wants us to be born spiritually. 
Uh, we have nothing to do with that. God is sovereignly in control of our spiritual birth. We simply respond in faith to the invitation. It's His will that begets us. We are drawn. We were known before the foundation of the world. We were given an angel for, to protect us to the point of salvation. We are drawn by the Father. Jesus Christ died. Uh, he provided the satisfaction to the Father. The Holy Spirit is given to convict our mind. We open our, our understanding to spiritual things. And at a certain point, we get saved. And then, and then we're expected to mature and grow and live and be useful and so forth. You see, that's only one illustration of the spiritual world. And we have around us a million uncounted invisible forces acting upon us. There are chemical things happening inside your body right now, invisible to you. You ate food probably or drank coffee or something for breakfast this morning. The chemical reactions are invisible reactions. Nevertheless, they are having a profound effect on you as you sit in your chair, right? Gravitational forces make you sit in your chair, invisible gravitational forces. There are relational forces at work here, you know, very powerful forces. You know, the person you're sitting beside or the, person, the personal members of your family, those are invisible bonds that are affecting the way you think, the way you relate, your emotional makeup, everything about you, your frame of mind. Uh, light, you know, we see certain amounts of the visible spectrum here, but there are in, invisible, you know, in, infrared, and uh, I don't know all the names of the young, you know, but there are, there is, a, there are many dimensions, uh, degrees of invisible light that are having an impact on you. You know, electrical forces, electromagnetic forces. You know, we are surrounded in this world by all these invisible things that nevertheless impact us and whether we understand their existence or not, we are still impacted by them, right? What an illustration of the same thing that goes on in the spiritual dimension that there are invisible beings, invisible decisions, invisible powers and warfares and struggles going on at this very moment as we meet that are having a profound effect on you and I. God's in control. Let's read about Daniel, his God, and God's ministers this morning. Daniel chapter 10. I want to just focus, first of all, on the first uh, four verses of the chapter that give to us a description of Daniel in his circumstances. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, now he's writing in the first person, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no present pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled, and in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is by the Hiddekel, I lifted up my eyes, and basically he recounts a vision of God himself. Now let's just spend a little bit of time. Let's put this in historical perspective. It's always, you know, the starting place for study. It says in the third year of Cyrus. This is the year 536 B.C. by Jewish reckoning. Um, if you remember events from the book of Daniel, you'll recall that back in the last two verses of chapter 5, three years before this, in the year 539, Daniel, the very night that the Babylonian Empire was destroyed, had been exalted and made the third man in the kingdom under Belshazzar and his father, who reigned from another place in Saudi Arabia, uh, he had made, been made the third most important man of the empire on the last day of the Babylonian administration. That night, Darius the Mede came in with his armies, destroyed the Babylonian army, and almost in a bloodless coup took over the reins of world leadership. And it trans the, as, as divinely ordained, the Babylonian empire turned into the Persian Empire. Darius the Mede was an ally of Cyrus the Persian. And in chapter 6, we have the account of Daniel. Remember that he refused to um, change his prayer habits, even though a very um, restrictive and unfair law had been passed by his enemies 
you know, and had been shoved through and signed into law by this very king, Darius the Mede. And just a couple years before that, Daniel had gone to the lion's den because he was faithful to pray, and God had delivered him. And then Darius had been moved off the throne by his more powerful ally, Cyrus, and within the last year or two, Daniel had been sort of, um, you know, he, by this time he was an 84 or 85 year old gentleman. And he probably was no longer very involved in affairs of state. But nevertheless, um, he probably had his own private apartment and he was left alone because he had been an important official in the previous administration. And he spent much time in prayer and meditation. He had a reputation. And in this, you know, three years after the beginning of the Persian Empire, Daniel was, um, as he explains, he had been uh, meditating and praying and fasting for three full weeks. He says 21 days. Um, over in verse... Um, uh, let me get this. Uh, verse 13, when the angel later on in this event explains to him why the, the angel is there and he is in conversation with Daniel, the angel said in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. In the previous verse, the angel said, look it, from the time you began to pray, from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I am come for your words. In other words, from the time that Daniel began his fasting and prayer regime, in 21 days prior to that, it took this angel that was talking to him 21 days to get there because of the spiritual battles that this angelic messenger had undergone in the preceding three weeks. And so Daniel was in mourning for three weeks, it says. Uh, verse 2, in mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. He was uh, fasting. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. You know, I didn't anoint myself at all. He didn't take a bath. It was like he was mourning in sackcloth and ashes. Right? Easterners are very fastidious people. Arabs today are still like that. You know, before they go in and worship at Mecca or bow before Mecca, they're supposed to wash their hands. They do this five times a day. Wash their hands and their feet. Right? Symbolically cleansing themselves. You know, maybe the Bedouins aren't very clean people, but others are, you know, still in the Middle East. And Daniel was in this culture, and he was normally very fastidious, you know, very much attention to personal hygiene. But when it came to spiritual mourning for sin and for prayer, they would, they would uh, you know, heap dust and dirt and ashes on their heads. They, they would put on old garments, or they would rip their clothes, and they would sit there and mourn in prayer for an extended period of time. And this is what was happening to him. And he explains that in the four and twentieth day of the first month, he was sitting by a river bank, by the river Tigris, which is still over there today. You know, it's um, it's the southern tributary uh, that goes into the Euphrates River. It's over where Iraq is today. Okay. And uh, and so on the 24th day of the first month. Okay. So if he'd been doing that for 21 days, that means he started on the uh, on the third day of that same month. Uh, you know, the first. Jewish, the first month of the Jewish calendar corresponds to the middle of our March to the middle of our April, right? And so about the third week of March to about the, uh, whatever that comes, you know, the second week of April, in the year 536 B.C., Daniel was in a, a meditation uh, and devotion and prayer regime. That's interesting because the first month of the Jewish calendar, if you go back to the book of Leviticus in the 23rd chapter, has three feasts that run back to back, bang, 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 during this very period in which Daniel was afflicting his soul and praying and fasting. On the 14th day of the first month, that's right at almost at the end of our march, is Pesach. Uh, in Hebrew, in English, it's uh, Passover, right? to commemorate, it's a one-night feast, to commemorate the redemption of God and saving the nation from the Babylonian bondage. Way back, sorry, Egyptian, thank you. The Egyptian bondage way back in the days of Moses. All right, that's recorded in Exodus chapter 12, Pesach. And in Exodus chapter 12, it was made a, a never-ending uh, memorial, a feast that was every year to be observed by God-fearing Jews. 
on the 14th of the month. That was Passover. Starting on the 15th and going through the 21st. Is it 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21st? Yeah, for the next seven days. And the seventh day was a, was, um, was a Sabbath day. Right? So the Passover was supposed to start on a Sabbath. And then uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to start Sunday morning and run through the next seven days and end on a Sabbath, on the next Sabbath, all right? And during those days, um, the, the, the Sunday morning, that Sunday and the following Sabbath, were, they weren't to do any work. They were to no, do no work on the Passover. They weren't supposed to do any work on the day after Passover, the first day of unleavened bread. And they weren't supposed to do any work on the following Sabbath day a week later. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictured the Holy Fellowship unleavened no leaven in the bread right very similar to what we as christians observe that our passover if you want to call it christ is our passover the bread is a picture of the per perfection of christ's person as a human being and the blood is a picture a symbolic picture of the blood shed for us did i say the blood the juice <laughs> the juice is a symbol of christ's blood shed for us so his person and his work are perfect right and so the unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was to symbolize the holy fellowship. When you eat bread, you break bread with one another, you fellowship with someone. It's like going to heaven supper with them. It's called the Lord's Supper for us today. It was symbolic of the fellowship that God's redeemed people, because of the Passover, the blood sacrifice, the fellowship that God's people would have with the holy God, that because they now themselves were holy, you see, because of the shedding of blood. All right? The very next day, I'm mean, sorry, uh, the 16th, um, the, the day after the Passover, two days after the Passover, was um, the Feast of First Fruits. And that day they were supposed to offer a burnt offering uh, at the temple they were, or tabernacle. They were supposed to offer drink offerings, a meal offering, and a wave offering. Right? Um, sure. Okay, so it's Nisan, 14th is Passover, uh, the same month, 15th through the 21st was unleavened bread, and on the 16th of Nisan, the next day, the second day into this feast was first fruits. Okay? And that's all found, if you want to go back and read it, in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, right? So everything that happens in the Old Testament, you have to put it in historical perspective. What Daniel was doing is that he was, before, this fe before the Feast of Passover, and going way beyond, the three days beyond the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he had observed personally Passover, Unleavened Bread, and first fruits privately. You know, that's understood, because that's the Old Testament story. And all godly Jews did that. And he had gone through this whole period, and through this period, you know, uh, in re uh, meditation and reflection on God's salvation by blood, uh, meditation and reflection on the holy fellowship that God's people had as a res basis, on the basis of the shed blood, and on the first fruits, which looked forward to uh, the resurrection. You know, first fruits is where the, the stuff comes out of your garden, first thing in the spring. You know, it's like the resurrection. The bud's coming down the tree. That's symbolic of resurrection life. Life after death. The winter is the <coughs> time of death. Spring is the time of resurrection. Okay? So it's symbolic. This was the time when their gardens began to produce on the 16th over in the Middle East. 16th of Nisan, which is like right at the end of March. Okay? very similar to us. I mean, their gardens are going over there right now. Okay? And so, this is what was happening um, or was supposed to happen. You have to understand, where's Daniel? Where's Daniel? He's in Persia. Where is Persia? It's 600 miles straight east of Jerusalem or northeast of Jerusalem. That's the place of God's judgment. The people are no longer, the Jewish people, Daniel and his people are not no longer in the vicinity of the temple. The temple was long destroyed way back in 586 by the invading Babylonians, the previous pagan administration. There wasn't a temple any longer. No wonder Daniel was mourning. There was no means for the Jews to offer up their burnt offerings because burnt offerings could only be offered in the temple or tabernacle on the altar of burnt offering. It was called the altar of burnt offering. You see? And so 
the things that God required his people to observe, it was actually physically impossible for them to actually do those things. And so Daniel, it says, ate no pleasant bread. You know, he was, he was going through personal mourning because of the uh, personal loss that he had gone through as a, as a young man being taken captive because of the national loss of the nation. They'd lost their temple. They were under divine judgment. It was even impossible for them to do what God actually required under the law. To observe these great feasts, um, he was also uh, afflicting his soul because of his own sin and because of the sin of his people. It says that um, over later on in verse 12, it says, "From the day, the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your God." See, he was afflicting himself. He was punishing himself, almost like a Roman Catholic penance for sin. You know, denying himself food. You know. Um, Lent, like Roman Catholic Lent, you know, you'd, you know, you'd make things, you'd decide what you're going to give up, you know. The same thing for Ramadan in the Muslim faith, you know, there's a whole month, you know, where they give up, you know, sex and, and, and food and, and all kinds of stuff, you know, supposedly, you know. And, uh, you know, and then it's a great big party like Mardi Gras right after, you know, okay, restrictions are off, back to the, back to the real life, you know. And, uh, and yet Daniel sincerely was afflicting himself before God. Okay, that's the background. He was by the side of this great river in Babylon. He was under national judgment. Now what, by the way, I just want to mention that Daniel's situation is maybe, if you wish, parallel or symbolic of our situation, right? Where's the temple of God today? Well, we know that it's in us, right? We are Christians. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? But where is the visible temple of God in the world today? It's not there. Right? That's coming in the millennium. Okay? God's visible power, His visible glory, His visible king, His visible priest are not in the world today. Right? We are under God's curse today. We are still under God's judgment today as believers. You know, that's why Alec McLeod died you know, 113 days ago. His body died because our bodies are still under the curse. In spite of the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. You know, which is first the salvation of the soul and the spirit. Later on, it's the redemption of our body. Okay, at at the rapture. Okay, but at this point, we we like Daniel under the curse. We like Daniel are living in a world where pagan rule is is visible, where God's rule is invisible. You see, you understand? Our our situation is very parallel. And like Daniel, I believe that if we will mourn for sin. If we will draw near to God, James 4.4 4 tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And this is exactly, precisely what happened in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel was drawing near to his God in prayer and fasting and, and confession. And what did God do? He went, click, and he opened the blinders. You see? Took off his blinders and he gave him a glimpse of who he was. Let's read 5 to 9. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a certain man... Now, God is not a man, the scriptures say. But Jesus Christ was a man, and he was God in the flesh. So this is not an unusual thing. Technically, this is known as a theophany. Theos is Greek for God. Phane is a part of a word, epiphany, that means manifestation. So theos, epiphanes, means manifestation of God. All right? And so God manifested himself. God manifested himself here to Daniel in human form, right? Um, so that Daniel could perceive, because we, can, we can't see into the spiritual realm, we can only see with our eyes in the physical realm. So if God was going to physically show himself to Daniel, he had to use a means that Daniel could perceive with the five senses. So Daniel saw a certain man clothed in linen, linen is white, whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. His body also was like the barrel and his face like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet in color like to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. That's interesting. Remember Saul of Tarsus? He was on the way to persecute Christians. Jesus struck him down, blinded him on the road. It specifically says in the two accounts of that in the book of Acts that that Saul was the only one that actually heard the voice, the, the defined words of Jesus as Jesus spoke to him in conversation in the, in the light. Right? It says later on in the book of Acts that the other man heard a sound, but they didn't actually hear the words.
But they did see the light, and it terrified them, and they ran away. Same thing here. The light shines on Daniel. Daniel sees the wor hears the words. He sees the vision. As a believer, he gets the intimacy that the pagans didn't get. The people around him didn't get to see and hear and understand what Daniel, God's man, did. And that's true for us as believers. You know, We have intimacy, potential intimacy with God that your neighbors and friends who do not know Jesus Christ will never have unless they become God's people. They're not interested either, <laughs> you know. They just could care less, right? It's God's people that are interested in intimacy with God. And so I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell on them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, Daniel said, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained my strength. You know, one of the greatest reasons why you should be regularly going to break the bread because you come into the presence of God. I mean, you're always in God's presence. But I mean, this is, a, you know, this is a corporate decision we make as God's people to gather together. And God, Jesus Christ is in the midst. What he said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we come into the presence of Jesus Christ. And when you come into the presence of Jesus Christ and remember his perfection and his perfect sacrifice, you have no grounds for pride and boastfulness. Like Daniel, you're reduced to the body, right? You get on your knees before God in true worship. In fact, the Greek word for worship is proskuneo, which means to prostrate yourself before, right? And true worship is where, you know, you don't get down like a Muslim on all four, you know, and put your head on the ground. I mean, that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. But God, it's, as Jesus said, they that worship God must worship him in spirit, and in truth, you know, so today we as Christians, we don't go through some hokey pokey ritual, you know, it's not your posture that counts, it's your heart, it's your mind, it's your attitude. And how many of us as Christians are not in the habit of prostrating our spirits before God? What happens when you get into the presence of God? If you never have done it too much as a Christian, someday you will, because the Bible says that every knee will bow. Why? Everybody's going to do carpet time, you know. When we meet Jesus Christ, okay? And he wants us to voluntarily do it, you know, to prostrate ourselves, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And Daniel did this. It's very important that we get this principle that only the righteous get intimacy with God. But when you get into intimacy with God, you always get lowered, right? And God always gets exalted. And it's always the case. Moses saw God pass by the crack, you know, if you read the book of Exodus, right? You know, and, and, he, and it terrified him. You know, God had to protect the poor guy in a little crack, covered him with his hand, and, and the light went past, you know, and he still got, you know, amazed. Right? Daniel got this vision, fell on his face before God. He quaked, he trembled, he went comatose. He could still hear and, hear and see, but it was like he was in a coma. Okay? John in the New Testament, right? You read the parallel vision to this. And, and you should. You should read Revelation chapter 1. John recounts the vision of Jesus Christ that he saw. And the, par the parallels are interesting. Uh, Daniel saw a man that had a white, just covered in white. Jesus, John saw Jesus covered in white. Um, his, Daniel says his face was like lightning. John says that his, um, his mouth had a, a great sword, like a flaming sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, Daniel said his eyes were like lamps of fire. John says his eyes were a flame of fire. Daniel says his arms and feet were like brass. Uh, John says his, arm, his feet were like fine brass. You see? Daniel says that his voice sounded like the voice of many people speaking. John says it sounded like his voice sounded like a multitude of waters, great waters. Waters is symbolic in Scripture of the people. You know? You get a million people together, and, you know, and then, you know, Take an audio tape of that, you know, and go out by the Lake Superior shore and take an audio tape of that. It's going to sound pretty similar, okay? And so, what we in essence have is is a vision of God coming and showing Himself, drawing near to the man who has humbled himself, confession and prayer. Okay? Uh, Steve, we were just talking this morning in Sunday school about the tri twelve tribes of Israel, and how in the Old Testament God exalted certain tribes and put them in certain positions. And it's interesting that this was the firstborn. He was not put in an exalted position because of his sin. He refused to repent of his sin. 
This man, Judah, was a sinner, but he repented of his sin openly. You know, And because of confession, God exalted Judah during his lifetime, and he exalted his descendants, his descendants. And so whenever the camp moved in the tribulation, in the wilderness, rather, uh, this was the first rank, this was the second rank, this was the third rank, this was the fourth rank, and so they would take off like this. You know, and the Levites would dismantle the tabernacle one piece at a time, and they would be interspersed in between the three rank, four ranks. You know, and they take it, you know, first they take the furniture, then they take the coverings, and then they take the boards, and the posts, and the ropes, you know. And uh, Judah is the, is the kingly line, you know. The king leads his people, you know. And it's interesting that if there's repentance, there's an exaltation, all right. And so Daniel was repentant. And, and look at the intimacy and the exaltation that he had with God. You know, when he came into the presence of God, you know, he fell down. He couldn't stand up. You know, he had to have divine intervention to stand up so he could even comprehend and, and communicate and fellowship. The angel had to strengthen him. And uh, I think the parallel is true in our lives as well. Uh, it's interesting that the first phrase in verse 10 is, and behold, when Daniel was like, he was almost comatose, it says in verse 9, behold, a hand touched me, which set me on my hands and on the palms of my hands. A hand touched me. And I don't know, I've always taken that as the hand of the angel. It could be the hand of the angel, or maybe it was God's hand. God reaching down, taking the the uh, let's, let's, uh, taking the initiative towards the the weak, the weak man, lifting him up. God's hand for believers is a hand of uh, exaltation and strengthening and encouraging. God's hand for the wicked is a hand of <laughs> you know uh, chastisement and judgment. You know, it, it, it holds a whip and it holds a, a scepter of condemnation out to the wicked. And to the believer, it's a scepter of fellowship. It's a, it's a hand of strength and encouraging. Right? Um, do you know God? How well do you know God? You, know, you and I as believers in the family of God have the privilege and opportunity to draw near. And He will show Himself to us. Right? God ever is holy. I mean, this is 600 B.C. or 536 B.C. And, and it's the same vision that you have 500 years later. You know, to John, or 600 years later, actually, to John. You know, God doesn't change. He's the same, holy, perfect. What he says is a flame of fire. You know, he's a, he divides. You know, his eyes are a flame of fire. He, he discerns, he perceives, he, uh, he cuts away all the crap, you know, and he gets right to the nitty-gritty. You know, he knows exactly what we are and who we are, you see? And yet, this holy God desires intimate fellowship with unholy men who have been made holy through his own process. Now, I want to... Uh, before we quit this morning, I want to just make a few comments about this last section in the chapter. Starting in verse 11 and going to verse 21, we have a description of God's messengers. That's what angel is. In the Greek word, uh, in the Greek, the word for angel is angelos. That's where our English word angel or angel comes from. It's actually based on the Greek word angelos. And angelo is the verb that means to proclaim or announce in the Greek language. So by definition, an angel is a, um, a messenger being, someone who is under somebody else's sovereign authority. He goes and says and does what he's told to do. In the Hebrew, it's the same thing. The Hebrew word for angel is uh, mal malak, malak. And, um, and uh, it means messenger. Malachi, the last the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, Malachi, <laughs> you know, some people pronounce it. The E on the end is a suffix that means my. And so the name Malachi simply means my messenger. We don't know the name of that prophet. Maybe his name was, maybe he was named Mal Malachi. Or maybe he's an anonymous author that just put a pseudonym, Malachi, down as, you know, but in Old Testament, New Testament, angel, angelic beings were messengers. And there are about a dozen descriptive, descriptive things given to us, insights into the angelic realm here this morning that are fascinating for, you to, for us to con contemplate. Verse 11, or verse 10. Uh, if it was an angel that touched him, then the angels have ability to interact with us on, a, on an actual physical level. That shouldn't surprise us. Remember back in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. 
they took the wives of all which they chose, and there were there were giants born to them in those days. Right? There are several theories about the meaning of that, but one of the theories is that rebellious, demonic spirits who followed Satan in rebellion against God in the very beginning, before the war, before Adam and Eve, um, that uh, these de de a certain amount of these demons actually decided to go down into the world. And, and take over the bodies of uh, real men and uh, mess up, mess them up, you know, and cause them to become immoral and decadent and stuff. And back in the days, you know, when uh, the curse hadn't been very long in the world, the, the gene pool hadn't been destroyed by the curse, right? Everything's degenerating, you know. So 6,000 years further on back into history, you know the gene pool was uh, was very less, much less affected than it is today. That's why basically we're all getting smaller and weaker and more decrepit as time goes on. But back in those days, you know, men had feet this big. You know, and there is an example of one down in the Paluxy River bed in Texas that they found a human footprint that's this long, in the same strata with big-toed uh, dinosaur tracks. Okay, I don't know who was chasing who. All right, but the point is, is that. Back then, people were bigger, and and giant in the Hebrew is a word that just means a man of renown. Now they were renowned in a variety of ways: renowned in size, renowned in wickedness. You see, and if the demons had anything to do with this, they were renowned in wickedness. David killed Goliath, who was one of the offspring of one of you know the gene pool was still, and some of those families was still very, fairly unaffected even for centuries. You see. There were still a few of those giants around in David's time in 1000 BC, right? And so um, angelic beings can have a lot to do physically with people, okay? Number two, verse 11, He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. This is not God speaking. This is one of God's messengers, right? Because God is never sent himself. Right? So this has to be one of his messengers speaking to him. And angels, this tells us that angels are, um, are their chief function is to impart information. At least many of the angels, their chief function is to impart information. They are sent to impart information. And specifically in verse 14, the angel went on to say, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. The angel goes on a little bit later and says, my specific job, my assignment today is to tell you what is going to happen to the nation Israel for a long period into the latter days. And that's what chapter 11 and chapter 12, where the vision gets detailed, what it actually does. It takes them from 536 B.C. and takes them right to the days of the Antichrist, the second coming of Christ, the setting up of Jesus Christ's kingdom on earth. Right to the latter days. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Same angel speaking, he says, Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, three years before, even I then stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now, 536 B.C., now I will show thee the truth. Okay? So the angel's job, their twofold job, is A, to impart information, and B, to carry out strengthening assignments wherever they're sent. Um... Verse uh, 11, and when this angel had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. You know, uh, angelic beings are awesome critters. You know, they're awesome creatures. They're, um, I don't know if I've ever had any dealings with angels. I can't say. I don't know if I ever have, right? But I do know that I wouldn't be surprised if I ever did, you know, I'm not going to be standing up there duking it out with them because they're awesome creatures. They they make you tremble in their presence. If you read Preddy's books, you get a sense of that. He's he's picked up on these descriptions, you know, and he's built this wonderful fictional story about the powerful demons that have influences on people and make them tremble. Um, the angel, though, the good angels have a message of peace. Then said he to me, Fear not, Daniel. Fear not. Then he, another angel comes along later on and says, um, uh, verse 19, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. You see, God's angels, 
do not bring fear. Remember it says in Romans chapter 8 that God has not given to us a spirit of fear and of bondage, but of, no, it's not Romans 8, that's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. God has not given to us a spirit of fear and of bondage, but of love and of peace and of a sound mind or something like that. God's messengers, including the Holy Spirit, who is, if you wish, a divine agent and messenger that is sent to us, are given to bring peace into our lives, to bring comfort and strength into our lives, to build us up. The devil's messengers always do exactly the opposite. They bring turmoil, confusion, pain, sorrow, suffering, and everything else. Right? Now we're out of time. Just getting what it gets really good here. But this angel says, look at from the time you began to pray for 21 days, I've been fighting my way through the spiritual forces to get to you. I was fighting with the prince of Persia. That's not surprising because the demon that controlled Darius the Persian or Cyrus the Persian was a very powerful demon. Very powerful demon. It took, took this good angel three weeks to get past the defenses and the forces set up by the underlings of this prince of Persia for him to get through and to strengthen Daniel and to bless him. But, uh, you know, who wins? You know, the good, good, the good side always wins in God's sovereign dealings, right? They, uh, the good angels are the sovereign angels, the, the more powerful angels, because they, God is on their side. It says in verse 13 that Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And so, um, we don't know who this angel was. I'm... Uh, I believe is probably Gabriel because Gabriel is named in the story in Matthew and Luke. You know, of Jesus' birth, he was sent with the angelic announcement of Jesus' birth. Um, you know, Gabor, the Hebrew word Gabor, El, Gabriel, uh, means warrior, strong warrior of God. El, God, right? Uh, yeah, I know, but uh, Michael was sent to help me. The the speaker is not Michael; it's another angel. You see. And he says at the end of the chapter, verse 21, I will show you, Daniel, what is noted in the scripture of truth. There is none that holds with me in these things but Michael, your prince. So it seems like the great prince Michael was specifically assigned to help Daniel, the great man of God. And there's only two of those guys standing there. Well, we know Gabriel was intimately involved in Jewish affairs <laughs> from other places in the scripture. So it's probably Gabriel and Michael, you know, the two top dogs in, in God's army, invisible army, you know, one of the chief princes. Right? There is great spiritual warfare that goes on. You better believe it, that you and yourselves do not have the power and ability to turn one of your unbelieving neighbors or family friends or a disobedient Christian acquaintance into fellowship with God. You and I don't have that ability. Only God can change a soul, can change a heart, can change a mind. And he uses these invisible agents to accomplish his purposes. The same kind of thing is found in um, in um, missionary literature, you know, where missionaries you know, sometimes have been given visions and stuff of uh, of very powerful beings, or even their enemies have been given visions of very powerful beings protecting the angels. Remember the time that Elijah in First Kings, you know, was sent um, to um, he was he was praying, he was the man of God, and uh, I think the king was sent to. Forget how the story goes. He was sent to um, to communicate with Elijah, and he went, but he was trying to kill Elijah, 
and, and every time he sent forces three times in a row to kill Elijah and, and every time these forces of 50 or 100 men would see angelic beings you know and they'd turn around and, and run and the kingdom would send them back you know